Oi, bem-vindo to Tasting History. Today we are going to be celebrating the 200th anniversary of Brazilian independence by making feijoada, their national dish, using a recipe from 1928. So thank you to my Patreon patrons for continuing to support this channel as we dive into the controversial origins of feijoada, this time on Tasting History. So before we actually get to the feijoada, I wanted to give you some context, uh, the story behind why I decided to make this right now. And that is because next week, on September 7th, 2022, Brazil will be celebrating their bicentennial. Now obviously, the story of how a country became independent is long and convoluted and very complex, but here's a really short breakdown. What happened was in 1807, Napoleon Bonaparte, doing his Napoleon Bonaparte thing, invaded Portugal. So the royal family, led by Prince Regent João of Braganza, hightailed it to their colony of Brazil, which, for all intents and purposes, became the new capital of the Portuguese Empire, even being elevated to the status of kingdom in 1815. And shortly after that, the Prince Regent became King João VI. And everything was hunky-dory until 1821, when the king had to head back to Portugal to put down a little revolution that was going on. And with him went the courts and most of the government, but he did leave behind his 22-year-old son, Dom Pedro, to hold down the fort while he was gone. Well, now with the government and the courts back in Portugal, it didn't take them long to be like, hey, Brazil, you're gonna actually go back to, to being a colony and lose all of the privileges that you had. And they called Dom Pedro back to, uh, back to Portugal as well. He wasn't needed there anymore. And he was like, eh, I, I don't think so. Or more politely, since it is for the good of all and the general happiness of the nation, I am willing. Tell the people that I shall stay. This took place on January 9th, 1822, and became known as Dia do Fico, or I Shall Stay Day. This kicked off a war for independence, and nine months later, on September 7th, 1822, while on the banks of the Ipiranga River, Prince Pedro declared Brazil independent, with a cry of independence or death. And shortly afterward, he was crowned as Pedro I, Emperor of Brazil. And if the writings from the time are to be believed, it is very possible that he actually enjoyed a bowl of feijoada at his coronation dinner. Now this dish can vary from family to family and region to region, and really kind of depends on what food is available at the time. But overall, the dish hasn't seemed to have changed all that much in the last couple centuries. So what he might have eaten in 1822 is probably very similar to this recipe from 1928 in Manuel Quirino's A Arche Culinaria na Bahia. It is essential that the beans used be fresh so that the feijoada turns out delicious, with preference for the mulachino variety, although others prefer the black bean. Separate any grains and debris from the beans and any beans damaged by the weevils or woodworms, and finally wash beans in cold water. While this is done, scald the dried beef on the fire and wash it of any impurities with water. The beans, dried beef, green meat or stew meat, and bacon are put to boil, then add sausage, salted pork that's been washed to remove the salt, chopped onion, black pepper, tomato and garlic, and a little vinegar. Along with that, add one or half a bay leaf, depending on the amount of feijoada. To make it tastier, add Portuguese sausage and add some of the grease from the sausage. It's not all that different from the modern version, though black beans do seem to be the preferred bean in most of Brazil today, though the mulechinho is still eaten in some regions. Also, he says to use fresh beans, and if you can find fresh beans, great, but frankly, if you don't live next to a bean farm, I don't think that's going to be very easy, so I'm using dried beans, and you probably should too. Now, another term that popped up that I was rather confused about was the term carne verde, or green meat. And I was like, green meat, what is that? Uh, so maybe I thought like spoiled meat, but it turns out that green here is used to mean new or fresh, like if you were green on a job or something like that. So it's fresh meat. And it seems that fresh meat was not all that common in the 19th and early 20th century, partly because the, the heat and humidity of that area doesn't really lend itself to, to keeping fresh meat fresh for very long if you don't have any kind of refrigeration. Luckily, I do have refrigeration, so I will be using fresh meat or green meat for my feijoada. So for this recipe, what you'll need is around two pounds or five cups of dried black beans, one pound or 450 grams of carne seca. So this term is actually often translated as beef jerky. And 
I, I don't love that translation, at least here in the United States, because if we say beef jerky, we mean something thin and dry that you open the bag and then you eat. That is not what this is. It's not cooked. It is dry aged and, and highly salted, but you need to cook this meat or you're not, gonna, you're not gonna feel well. A half pound or 225 grams of fresh stew meat, a half pound or 225 grams of bacon, a half pound or 225 grams of payo sausage, and one pound or 450 grams of Portuguese sausage known as linguiça, and about a half pound of salted pork, whatever cut you can find. Two onions chopped, one teaspoon of black pepper, two tomatoes peeled and diced, eight cloves of garlic crushed, two tablespoons of white wine vinegar, and two or three bay leaves. So first, soak the beans in cold water overnight. Now, if you forget to do this, it's no big deal. They're going to be just fine. They just take a bit longer to cook. However, you do need to remember to soak the dried meat and salt pork at least 12 hours, preferably 24, switching out the water every couple of hours. The more, the better. I cannot tell you how salty this meat is, so you have to get as much salt as you possibly can because it's going to be a really, really salty dish if you don't. Once the dried meat has soaked, add it to a pot of boiling water and scald for 20 minutes. And while you do this, you can cut all of the other meat into little pieces, including the sausage. The one thing that you might have trouble cutting up uh, is the dried meat. It's really, really tough, so put that in in some big chunks, let it cook, and then at the very end, take it out and cut that up. Now, once the meat is scalded, find the biggest pot that you have in your house, add the beans and about a gallon of water. Then add the bay leaves, carne seca, stew meat, and the bacon to the beans and mix together. Then set it over medium heat and bring to a simmer. Also, you might be tempted to cut all of the fat off of the carne seca or the dried meat. It can have a lot of fat on it, but leave most of it on because that is actually where a lot of the flavor is. You can remove it later. Some people actually put an orange half or two in there and it's supposed to soak up the grease. I just skimmed mine off because the orange does affect the flavor and our recipe does not use orange. Now let it simmer for about an hour, stirring every once in a while, and making sure that it doesn't really start to boil. The charm of this dish is the slow cooking process, and that's really where a lot of the flavor happens. Uh, so you just want a light simmer and let it go for a long time. Now when the hour is almost up, put a frying pan over a medium flame and add the sausage in to cook for just a few minutes until it starts to brown. And you may have to do this in batches if you have a lot of sausage. Now, besides browning it, what you're actually looking to do is get some of that grease out of there so you can then fry the onions. But first, take the cooked sausage, put it into the pot along with the salted pork, and then add the diced onions to the pan with the sausage grease. Let it cook for about a minute, then add in the garlic and cook until the onions start to brown. Then add everything from the pan into the pot. Finally, add the tomatoes, pepper, and the vinegar, and stir. Then continue to let it simmer for another hour or even two. It's really all going to depend on, on how firm or soft you want the beans. Some people like them really, really mushy, but others like them a little bit more al dente. And that is preferred, especially if you have a lot and you're going to be reheating this over the next few days because basically every time it gets reheated, they're going to, to get softer. And actually, the recipe that we're working from today says that if you suffer from stomach or liver issues, you can crush the beans and pass through a sieve to get rid of the bean skins. The same process should be done for serving older people. So if that's you, maybe get them nice and mushy. But regardless, definitely keep an eye on the pot as it's simmering because it will, the water will start to, to go away and it'll, it can get a little bit dry. But worse than that, it can get really, really salty. The salt will concentrate. So you want to add a little bit of water when you need to. So yeah, and then just let it do its thing. And it's going to take a little while. So there's plenty of time to remind you to hit the like button, make sure that you have pre-ordered the Tasting History Cookbook online, and I still have time to tell you about the history of feijoada. Feijoada gets its name from its main ingredient, feijão, or beans. Beans were a very important crop for the indigenous people of Brazil. And when Europeans first came to Brazil, they often wrote that the indigenous people would eat a lot of beans dusted with their actual staple crop, mandioca, also known as cassava or manioc. It would be made into a flour and dusted on top. 
This dish of beans and manjoca became popular with every group that came to Brazil, including the Portuguese colonists and the enslaved people they brought over from Africa. One French woman who was staying in Brazil in the 1850s wrote about seeing the African population eating this feijoada, and she actually uses that term, though that version of the dish seems to be quite different from, from the modern version, because she says that she sees black beans being cooked in a pot over two stones with a fire underneath, and then the beans were sprinkled with manjoca flour. Then kneading it all in their hands and forming large balls, they commenced to throw them in their mouth with much dexterity. If you wish to eat them with a spoon, they all persist that it takes away much of the flavor of their feijoada. So maybe we should be eating our feijoada with our hands, though the fact that they were able to eat it with their hands makes me think that the consistency was rather different than today's. But the point is that at this time, the enslaved people were making a form of feijoada. Now, she doesn't mention any meat, but she's just seeing it being made, so that doesn't mean that there wasn't meat in it at the time. But Isabel Burton also wrote about actually eating feijoada, and she also makes no mention of meat. The staple food of the people of the country, which takes the place of what the potato would be to the Irish, is a savory mess of small brown beans called feijão. A very coarse flour called farinha, which looks like a dish of shaved horseradish, is usually sprinkled over the beans. Then this is called a feijoada. It is delicious, and I should have been quite content to, and often did, dine on it. That farinha she mentions is the manjoca flour. Now, later descriptions, not long later, but later descriptions of the dish do start to definitely include meat, and it is almost always pork. In the 1850s, the English writer Thomas Eubank wrote about his time in Brazil, which he alluringly titled, A Journal of a Visit to the Land of the Coca and the Palm. The prominent feature in dietetics here is the enormous consumption of pork. It is used by the highest and the lowest, and used every day. And then what pork? It is all fat. And so, with the Portuguese and Brazilians, a dinner without tozinho, bacon, is next to no dinner at all. Feijão com tozinho is the national dish of Brazil. And like he says, it was a dish for the highest and the lowest in society, and he's not the only one to have said that. In the 1880s, an Englishman traveling and staying with the cream of society in Brazil wrote another favorite dish is the feijoada, a stew of meat and black beans, which is also freely covered with farinha and made into a kind of thick mess, most unpleasant to look at, but excellent. A feijoada is one of the standing dishes at all the meals of His Majesty the Emperor. Though he does say that one time when he was in France, the Brazilian minister was throwing a big dinner, uh, like a big state dinner, with all Brazilian dishes, and the feijoada, which was on the menu, never came out. So when the minister went to ask the chef what happened, he said no power on earth would induce him to send up such a disgusting dish. How French. Now, while we know what feijoada turned into, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly when feijoada began, who the first people to make feijoada were, because partly we don't have a lot of written accounts except from the very, very top of society. I mean, everything that I've read pretty much has come from the very wealthy and privileged, so that's who they're writing about. They're not going to have a lot to say about the dining habits of the enslaved population or the indigenous population at the time. But as I was researching this dish, I found that every single article that I could find was really concerned with the question, who was the first group of people to make this dish? It really seems to be a bone of contention, and as I am not Brazilian and I've got no dog in this fight, I'm just going to tell you what I've read, and you can make up your own mind, or, like I did, I didn't make up my mind. So one theory is that it was first made by the early African slaves who came over and would make the dish using the scraps of meat that were left over from the kitchen. Though a lot of the articles state that those scraps of meat were things like salted pork ear and tail and tripe, but that's a rather modern conception that those would be scraps. Those are used in some very fancy dishes in the 18th and 19th century. So that doesn't, that reasoning doesn't really work out, but it doesn't mean that the theory doesn't work out. It's just more likely that they would have used that very fatty bacon that everyone seemed to have access to. 
Another theory is that it has its origins in Europe with dishes like the French cassoulet, beans and meat cooked together. The thing is, it's hard to make a definite connection there seeing as every culture who has ever had access to beans and meat have put them together in a pot and cooked them. So it's hard to say that that is a definite descendant. I mean, is Western style chili a descendant of cassoulet? I don't think so. Now there are different feijoadas to be found in other former Portuguese colonies like Mozambique and Angola. But again, they're just meat and beans cooked together and often the meat and the beans are different from the versions of feijoada in, uh, in Brazil. So other than etymologically connected, it's hard to say that one really had to do with the other. If anything, I would actually put the origin of the dish with the indigenous people of Brazil who were known to eat the beans with the manjoca flour and most early accounts seem to say that that's all that the early feijoada was. Now I'm not saying that any one of these theories is right or wrong and most of the articles that I read uh, usually came to the conclusion of, well, this might be how it, how it went. And, and I think that that's kind of the best you can do Partly because that's just not really how food typically works. There's rarely one group of people who, or, or you know, at one time who create a dish, like fully formed, and that is when it was done. It's more of an evolution with different influences from all different cultures and, and practices putting into to one dish. That's how most dishes evolve. And that's why I think it's so fitting that feijoada is the national dish of Brazil because Brazil has so many different people from different cultures coming together and they've all had their fingerprint on feijoada. It's kind of like that story about stone soup. Everybody puts their ingredient into the pot, except that there is no stone in feijoada, or at least if there is, you have done something very wrong. Though maybe you've just created a new variation on feijoada, and there are so many variations on this dish. Regionally, everywhere you go, they have their own little way of, of doing things. Often the differences come in what is served with the feijoada. There's a term called feijoada completa, which is kind of a whole meal around the feijoada. On the table was seen the traditional feijoada, dishes filled with manjoca, a large platter of rice, and two chickens, as well as bananas and oranges. This is about the usual Brazilian dinner to be found in the interior, where fresh meat is a rare thing. Now that was back in 1850, and today a lot of those things are still served with feijoada. There's actually a song from Chico Buarque about feijoada completa. It's called Feijoada Completa, and it's super catchy, and I'll put a link in the description to where you can listen to that while you make the rest of your feijoada. And here we are, feijoada from 1928. Delicia. And I made mine as a feijoada completa with a bit of rice, collard greens, orange slices, and of course, the manjoca flour, better known as farofa. Mmm, so complex. So many flavors. It's definitely still salty. Um, not overbearingly so, but I think you want to make sure to, to kind of taste near the end and see if you need to add water or anything, because depending on what meat you're using, it can be really, really salty. Even after soaking it overnight and boiling it and everything, the, the, the meat is really salty, so you want to get as much out as you can. I actually really, really love that flour on top because the flour adds this kind of crunch to it. it it's almost like putting uh, like breadcrumbs on top of a, a soup or a stew. It adds that just some texture that isn't, um, that isn't really soft. I'm going to have a little bit more because I want to try the sausage. Mm. The cool thing about this dish is that there are so many types of meat in it that each bite is going to be a little bit different because you're not going to get all of the meats in one bite. So one time you'll have a piece of one sausage and the next time it'll be bacon or, or salt pork. Really, really interesting. And, and with all of the accompaniments, I mean, this is, this is a full meal. So whether or not you plan on celebrating the bicentennial of Brazil, I do suggest you try to find some feijoada. Either make it at home for yourself or go find it at a Brazilian restaurant if you don't want to do all the work and end up with a huge pot of feijoada. Not that that's a bad thing. 
So don't forget to like this video, follow me over on Twitter, Tasting History One, and I will see you next time on Tasting History. Ciao!